Hello everyone and welcome to the very first ACCA performance management session for your September 2024 attempt. This is Tushita Gupta, ACCA affiliate and I'm going to be your tutor for this paper, for this attempt. So um, before we get on with it, I'll let you know about the structure of the session a little bit. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself first of all and then we'll talk about the PM exam, what are the components of the syllabus, what does the exam structure look like, uh, you know, what are the pass rates, why, uh, you know, the pass rate is probably lesser than the other skill level exams, uh, you know, what are the mistakes which other students make so that you know those mistakes earlier so that you do not make those mistakes. And then I'll also give you some tips for all of the three sections which are there in the PM exam and then we'll talk uh, about the syllabus a little bit. So this is what the entire structure of this session is going to look like. Uh, now just beginning with a brief introduction of mine. Uh, my name is Tushita Gupta. I'm an ACC affiliate. Uh, I hold a double bachelor's degree. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in commerce from Delhi University and I've also completed the Oxford Brooks BSc Applied Accounting which is done in collaboration with ACCA and um, you know I have been uh, guiding and mentoring students Students, teaching students for over two years now and uh, you know along with that I also have corporate experience to you know give you actual real life examples for you to be able to understand the concepts better so that you're not just you know cramming things or just understanding things theoretically but also putting them to practice in real life so this is what my aim would be to always give you real life practical examples now this is about me uh, let's move ahead with uh, the ACCA performance management exam. Allow me a moment to share my screen. All right. So I'm just fixing it in a manner so that you're able to see me and also see the slides which we have. All right, so um, I've already told you that th these are the classes for your performance management and I'm going to be your faculty. So now let's begin with what PM is. So basically when you talk about performance management, you're going to step in the shoes of a management accountant. So if you are this person over here, you're going to assume that you are a management accountant. Performance management is all an extension of your F2, the financial, uh, sorry, the management accounting paper. So over here in PM, you're going to step into the shoes of a management accountant. Now, if you are a management accountant, you're primarily responsible for four things. Number one is planning. Number two is decision making. Number three is performance evaluation. And number four is control. So planning is where you actually make plans. You think that, okay, I'm supposed to do this. I'll do this. I'll do this. And then ultimately, when it comes to decision making, you choose out of all of the plans that you've made, which plan is the best one, which is the one that you should go ahead with. And then once you have made the decision, you move on to performance, you move on to the execution of the decision that you have taken. So once things have actually happened the way you had decided, then you move on to evaluation. This is where you evaluate that have things went according to how you planned them or have they been better or have they been worse? So over here, you make an evaluation that what you were supposed to do, has that work been done or has it not been done? Then the next step is, is towards controlling. So if at all, I am not on the right track through evaluation, I will find out that, you know, I was probably supposed to make 200,000 units, but I only made 180,000. So the shortage, which is there, the performance, which is not up to the mark, which I had planned, so over here, control is going to tell you how you could, you know, put in some measures so that the next time you're able to achieve what you had planned to achieve. So this is what your entire performance management paper looks like. It's going to be, so the four things which are listed over here are nothing but your syllabus areas. So these are the four areas in which your performance management syllabus is divided. 
PM comes at uh, so the other name for PM is F5. So it is the fifth paper right after the law paper is where it arises in the sequence. Uh, if you talk about the linkage, like I told you earlier, it's linked to your management accounting F2 exam. A lot of you would probably have taken exemptions for the same, but even if you have, uh, there's no worries because uh, I'm going to you know cover the basics from the management accounting as well so that you do not feel uh, that you know i did not study management accounting so i'm not getting performance management i'm going to make sure that i uh, you know build your concepts from management accounting to bring you to performance management so this is what my approach is going to look like then next, like, uh, let's talk about what the exam structure for performance management looks like. So uh, exam structure, basically, you have three sections in total. The first section is called section A, wherein you have 15 questions in total and one question is worth two marks. So 15 multiplied by two gives you 30 marks. Section A in total comprises of 30 marks for you. 15 questions, two marks each. Then the second section in your exam is section B, wherein there are case study questions. Now section A was individual 15 questions, no relation with each other. But over here in section B, you'll get three case studies. Each case study will have five questions. And again, one question in the case study is worth two marks. So two multiplied by five gives you 10 marks for an entire case study. So you'll have one case study on the left hand side of your exam screen. And on the right hand side, you will have uh, the questions pertaining to that. So this one case study is going to be relevant is going to be the information that you need to answer those five questions, which are based out of this case study. So this is what one case study question of section B looks like. Similarly, you'll have three questions in section B for these case studies. So in total, again, 15 questions, five, five questions, each case study, uh, two marks each. So multiply and you get 30 marks for the entire section B. Now coming to the last section, section B, this is about constructed response questions. Herein, you do not have any MCQs, no fill in the blanks, no matching, no true and false. Section C is all about constructing your responses. So you will be provided with Excel or the word processors where you need to type in, you need to punch in the numbers, type in your answers. And that's how you construct your responses in section C. So section C questions are also called CRQs, constructed response questions. So these will be, uh, you know, one question carries 20 marks. It will be divided in a lot of, uh, you know, requirements which are there in the question. So one question will be for 20 marks. So you have two questions in section C like that, hence totaling to 40 marks. So this is what your exam structure looks like. Section A, 30 marks, section B, 30 marks, and then section C, 40 marks. Now that we're talking about the structure, let's also discuss a little bit about the pass rates. So if I talk about the uh, uh, pass rates, let's do next, but let's first talk about the time management. So uh, the entire paper that you have is 100 marks in total, and you have three hours allowed to uh, you know solve this exam so if you convert those hours to minutes three hours multiplied by 60 minutes gives you 180 minutes in total so 180 minutes you have to answer questions worth 100 marks so if you do the math you have 1.8 minutes for one mark so basically if you have a two marker question talking about a section a question you essentially have roughly three and a half minutes to solve a two marker mcq so this is how you're going to divide your time amongst all of the three sections and you're not going to spend any extra time on any question because if you spend if you go over time on one question you're gonna you know lose out on the marks which you could score in the questions that are ahead so that's why uh, time management is also something that you know we will be laying a lot of emphasis on and as i begin to teach you i'm going to you know give you more insights on how you can manage your time better so this is what the exam structure looks like and i've to uh, i've briefed you a little bit about time management also uh, the rule which i just told you about is called 1.8 minute per mark rule it's a thumb rule which you can follow in every acca exam and it's going to help you a lot to you know uh, avoid overspending time in one question and hence 
uh, compromising on other questions. If you avoid this and you answer all of the questions, even if you've answered all questions, but not to the full extent, rather than, you know, uh, answering only one question well and the other ones have suffered. So you have better chances of passing in the first case rather than in the second one. So this is what uh, I would like to tell you about the exam structure. Uh, and the time management. Now I will take you to the pass rates uh, which we have for this. Uh, I'm just switching my screen to the ACCA website. I'll also teach you how you can uh, navigate through the website and you know uh, find out what the pass rates look like. So I just went to ACC. Uh, I just went to Google and typed ACCA PM pass rates. All right. So over here, the very first link, if you click over here, you'll get the pass rates for the ACCA qualification. So this is for PM. We are concerned about PM at the moment. So if you see in March 2024, which has been the latest attempt because June is not published yet. So 45% is the pass rate of PM. That means uh, barely out of two students, one student makes the cut. Uh, if two students have appeared for the exam, only one student, lesser than one student, actually ends up clearing the performance management exam. So if you see earlier, this has been 42, 40, 40, 44. So basically, the range of the pass percentage lies between 40 and 45. It keeps on fluctuating with every attempt. But this is what the pass rate usually looks like. It's a range between 40 and 45. Now, going back to where we were earlier, uh, a lot of you would think that, you know, because the pass rates are such low, uh, PM would be a hard or a difficult exam. But let me tell you, PM is not a hard or a difficult exam. It is not. But, you know, at the same time, it is an exam which does require you to gain knowledge of all areas. That means you should not be going for selective study. You should study all of the syllabus areas well and uh, Apart from just studying the syllabus areas, you also need to have ample practice. So once you have covered the syllabus areas, it's not enough. You also have to practice the things. So I'm going to make sure that we cover each and every syllabus area and I'm going to make you practice as much as I can in class. But you also have to understand that just practicing with me is not going to help you. You have to practice on your own also. So whenever, as soon as I've finished uh, a chapter or a syllabus area, you're supposed to practice side by side. Otherwise, if you keep the practice portion to, for the end, you're going to burden yourself towards the end of the you know time that you have left for preparation. And it's going to hamper your uh, overall performance in the exam. So this is what I want you all to do. You all are supposed to uh, practice side by side as and when we are done with one syllabus area so this is what the approach is going to look like i'm going to keep following up with you uh you know what is the progress but you need to be honest with yourself this is a professional qualification that you're working towards so make sure that you are putting in the efforts you know there might be people who would be working there might be uh, you know college students but you need to make sure that you get the time you take out the time to practice and you know work hard towards the PM exam. So now we've discussed about the pass rates as well. Next, let's talk about the reasons why, you know, those 45% uh, is the pass rate. That means 55% students fail. So why do those 55% students fail? What are the reasons? So the number one reason is not understanding the requirement. So a lot of you while reading the questions in the exam would perhaps, you know, be in a hurry. You would not read the requirement carefully and you will answer something else. You know, something else has been asked and you answer something else. So if you have not understood the requirement, you will not be able to give the correct answer. So it's very important that you understand exactly what the examiner is asking you. And then you answer, you give the examiner the very same thing which he has asked from you. So uh, this is very important and I'm going to be teaching you this as well, how you identify and understand the requirements, what exactly are you supposed to do in a question. Then number two reason is that, you know, uh, when there are section C questions where students have to draft their answers, there's a big tendency that students answer what they want to answer rather than what is actually asked. So if at all they do not know what is asked, they would 
you know probably come up with their own requirements and answer those instead of answering what the examiner has actually asked them so uh, this is one more reason why they think they would probably get the marks over there but it's not uh, marks will only be awarded if you have addressed what the requirement is by the examiner if you haven't done so even if you've written a perfect answer to another requirement you would not be you know getting the marks unless you answer what exactly is asked now the third reason is time management like i told you 1.8 minute per mark rule uh, a lot of students tend to uh, you know spend uh, a lot of time when it comes to any of the sections maybe whichever is the weak area they spend more time on that but because of spending more time on a specific question uh, you know they are left with lesser time for the further areas of the exam which leads to uh, you know haphazardness and uh, uh, you know not being able to complete the exam on time if you do not answer the entire 100 marks of paper eventually your chances of passing the exam also become less so it's very important that you manage your time well and you answer 100% of the questions in the exam only when you 100% answer all of the questions that is when you maximize your chances of passing even if you leave one mark two mark you know this is not something that you should do you should always strive to answer the 100% of the requirements in the exam no question shall be left unanswered there's no negative marking in acca no matter what you do uh, it's either two or it's zero so so there's no negative marking there's no harm even if you do not know any answer try to think what could be the closest answer and mark the mark the same do not i repeat do not leave any question unanswered then the next reason is that not covering the whole syllabus so i am going to make sure that we cover the entire syllabus you study the entire thing and you know this is one reason which will not be there for you guys then uh, stepping up from ma to pm so ma is the f2 exam uh, you know ma exam is a, a base of what we uh, require in pm so the base is something which you know the students if your base is not clear uh, there may be a difficulty in you know coming and studying towards pm because you're probably trying to reach for the second step when you haven't done the first step so uh, again i'm going to try my best over here to bridge that gap between ma and pm and you know teach you right from the scratch right from the basics so this is what we will do to address this and then number 6 is poor drafting skills so drafting skills are primarily required in section c discursive answers where you you know you're given a word processor where you have to type in your answer so drafting skills can only and only be done through two things number one is learning the technique and number two is practice so i am going to teach you the technique i'm going to teach you how you have to practice and ultimately you have to do the practice through which you will also overcome this factor then the last one is struggling in theory uh, you know theory or discursive uh, objective questions so these objective test questions basically are mcqs uh, you know numericals we all are able to answer because we practice numericals well we you know solve a lot of practice questions but when it comes to theory there are students who you know feel a weakness when it comes to theoretical or discursive areas now here also we are going to make sure that we get ample practice of these type of questions so uh now let's talk about a few tips and tricks that i would like to give you like i told you there are three sections in your acca pm exam i'm going section wise and giving you section wise tips over here so tip uh let's start with tips and tricks for section a number 1 is that you have to cover the whole syllabus now because in section a you know uh entire syllabus is the horizon there is no specific you know syllabus area which only gets tested in section a uh no matter what syllabus area the question is from it can appear in section a so it's very important that you have to cover the entire syllabus do not leave even a small paragraph of the syllabus you have to cover the entire syllabus then the second point over here is that you have 3.6 minutes per question going through the classic 1.8 minute per mark rule so you have a two marker question over here 1.8 multiplied by 2 gives you 3.6 minutes which is roughly 3 and 1/2 minutes so uh, you know as long as you have 
taken three and a half minutes, it's okay. As soon as three and a half minutes are up and you're still not able to solve the question, you're going to move ahead and you're going to come back to it later. Make sure you do not overspend time. If you overspend time in section A, you are left with lesser time for section B and section C, which is going to be a problem for you uh, in the overall PM exam. Then the third tip which I have is that you need to read the question carefully. So in section A, because you know the questions are very small, you think that you have read the requirement, but you because you're in a hurry or because you know you're too excited to see the question, probably you have practiced something similar earlier. You tend to you know uh, go a little bit easy on it, and you do not read the question carefully, even though these things might be seeming very small to you. But this can make the difference between a pass and a fail. So it's very important that you read the questions carefully. Make sure you have understood what exactly the question is asking from you. Then talking about the rounding of instructions. So, um, you know, in all of the section A questions, if at all there's anything numeric which you're supposed to answer, probably a percentage. So the percentage sign will always be mentioned. If at all it is mentioned, you're not supposed to put it in your answer box because it's already been mentioned. Similarly, for the rounding of instructions, usually they'll give you to how many decimal places they want their answer. It will be specified in the requirement itself that you need to answer to two decimal places. Let's suppose your answer has come out to be 17.569. So you're not supposed to write 0.569, even if your answer is correct, if the computer is going to mark it incorrect. You need to round off 569 to 57. Only when you uh, only when you answer to two decimal places, the exact format in which the you know uh, requirement has asked you, only then can you get the entire marks. Otherwise, even for solving the correct answer, you're not going to get the marks. And the reason is that section A and section B are computer marked. There are no humans involved in marking section A and section B in your performance management exam in ACCA. Uh, you know, the computer uh, has been fed the correct responses. If it sees exactly that, it gives you two marks. Otherwise, it gives you a zero. So that's why it's very important that you follow the rounding of instructions properly. Two decimal places, then you give two decimal places. If it asks for one decimal place, then you give it to one decimal place. If it does not ask for any decimal places, you round it off to the absolute number. So make sure that you follow the rounding of instructions properly. Now, these are the tips and tricks for section A. Let's talk about section B now. So when it comes to section B, you'll usually have a you know, a case study in section B. So on the left hand side, you have the case study given to you. And on the right hand side, you have the questions pertaining to that case study. So over there, you know, there will be multiple requirements, five questions you have to answer from the same case study. So make sure that you're highlighting the relevant information, anything which you think is important, you should highlight it, the same functionality is available on the ACCA software on which you have your exam. So it's very important that you keep highlighting anything which seems relevant to you. Then secondly is about time management. Like I told you, uh, 1.8 minute per mark. Each, sec uh, you know, each case study in section B is worth 10 marks. So 10 multiplied by 1.8 gives you 18 minutes per case study. Make sure that you do not overspend time even here also, because if you do so, section C suffers. So 18 minutes is the benchmark. As soon as you hit 18 minutes and one second, you're supposed to move ahead. So this is the tip number two. Then again, rounding of instructions very properly. You need to follow this. Otherwise, even correct answers can be marked incorrect. Reiterating that there's no human involvement over here. The computer has been fed the responses. If, he, uh, if the computer sees the exact response, only then you get the marks. Otherwise, you do not, even if your answer is correct. Now, moving ahead to tips for section C. Now, section C, like I told you, these are uh, proper constructed response questions. So over here also, the question which you will get on the left hand side of your screen is going to be a big question. Make sure that you highlight anything which seems relevant, which seems important to you, which you might need to come back to later while you're reading the case study. Then secondly, again, talking about time management, because one question in section C is worth 20 marks. 
you have 20 multiplied by 1.8, which gives you 36 minutes per question. So as soon as you hit that mark, you're supposed to move to the next question. Then the third tip which I give you is that you need to understand the requirements properly. Again, when we were talking about the reasons for failure, we had that not understanding the requirement. So make sure when it comes to section C questions, specifically for those where, which are discursive questions where you have to draft your answer, make sure that you have understood the requirements properly because if you misunderstand the requirement, you answer something else which the examiner has not asked you and you do not get any marks for answering the same. So this is tip number three. Now coming to the last tip for section C is that to your workings because you know you'll probably have word processors, you'll have excels given to you. So make sure that your workings are structured and are clearly set out. Make sure that, you know, this is not something haphazard, which the examiner is not able to figure out what have you done. There's one number there, one theory there. So make sure that whatever you're presenting to the examiner is structured, is clearly set out and is easy to follow. It's easy to understand what you have done. The more easy you make it, the more, you know, the examiner is in a better tendency to give you higher marks. So this is the tips and tricks that I would like to give you. Um, let's also see uh, how we navigate to the ACCA practice platform, which is a very important resource towards your preparation. So um, if you just go to Google again, over here, you're just supposed to type ACCA practice platform. Click on the very first link go to this part over here log into the practice platform and then you use your credentials over here once you have put in your my acca credentials it takes you to the acca practice platform over here you will find in this catalog the names of all of the exams so they have appeared here this is the performance management material these over here are the ACC official resources. Then there's some blank workspace for you to practice. So uh, these are the past exams, practice exams, specimen exams. So if I just open any random exam for once, this is PM practice exam one. Reload it so that whatever you have assigned to yourself shows over here in your self-assigned material. So uh, PM and practice exam one. So over here, this is how you launch your exam. You click, read the instructions, you go to the next page. Uh, sometimes there's an issue that it says that you have not viewed the entire screen, but you have. So you can just go back and open the exam again and we'll let you resume from there. So uh, this is what section A will look like. It is primarily MCQ type of questions. So you can navigate, this one is an MCQ type question. They can also be true, false, or where you have to input. So over here, you have to input the number of units, which they have, you know, whatever the requirement is asking you to do. And um, again, this is an input. Now, this was the rounding instructions aspect that I was talking to you about to the nearest whole dollar. So for example, if you're getting an answer of 5.8, 5.8 needs to be written as 6. If you write 5.8, you're going to get 0, even though your answer is correct. Now, um, this is again an MCQ format of question. Um, there can be true false as well. So now I'm going to show you what a section B question looks like. So like I told you, on the left hand side of your screen, you have the case study. And on the right hand side, you have the requirement. So this is the case study. This is the first question. So which whatever answer you put in over here, if you move to the next slide, the case study remains the same, but the question over here changes. So all five questions you need to answer in context of this case study, which is presented on the left hand side of your screen. Now, this is the second question. So now the case study has changed. Again, there will be five questions based on this very case study. Similarly, one more question and section B will end. Then question number 31 in section C is your section, uh, like the first constructed response question. 
So over here, you can see how you have the case study, a long one on the left hand side again. And then the right hand side, you have the space given to you for entering, constructing your own answer. So this is the requirement over here. It is for 20 marks in total. Seven marks are available for calculations and 13 for discussion, which you have to type on your own. So always and always they will give you, you know, the breakdown of how the marks are going to be allocated. So this is how you can uh, use this space over here to type in your answer. Now, let me show you what, uh, you know, a numerical question is going to look like. So over here, because there are some numbers which you need to calculate. So there's an Excel similar, a spreadsheet sort of a functionality given to you. Over here, you can put in the formulae as well. So if you have to use this, if I have to add both of these cells, I can do it normally like I do in Excel. Uh, some Excel formulae will work over here, not all, but whatever you need is definitely going to work over here. So you have nothing to worry about. Now, this is what a numerical question will look like. Again, if you navigate ahead, um, you know, you're going to have uh, the word processor, which we saw in the previous question as well. So this is what your ACCA practice platform looks like. You can practice multiple uh, exams over here. And one more resource which I want to show you guys is the ACCA study hub. So when I talk about the ACCA study hub, this is a newly launched resource, relatively newer one, where you can uh, find, uh, you know, chapter wise content, you can find quizzes, you can find practice questions. All of the things, uh, you know, which you probably need could be found over here. So this over here is the performance management exam. If you click on study, uh, you know, it's going to take you to all of the data, all of the content which is provided by ACCA for you to study towards performance management. Uh, this entire, uh, you know, the study text which is provided by the study hub is what I'm going to be using to teach you the performance management exam. I'm going to use the same content from here. Uh, this is provided directly by the ACCA. And regarding the practice portion, uh, I would uh, want you all to follow the BPP kit as well as practicing questions from the study hub which means the quizzes as well as the practice questions so this is what uh, you know the books that we are going to follow and what practice questions are we going to do now if you just click over here this is how they've given you a breakdown of this chapter similarly there's a quiz at the end so quiz can be reached from here also and then there are practice questions which you can do chapter wise and section wise so this is how uh, this resource is a very useful resource which you can use towards your preparation. These two resources are very important in your preparation towards the ACCA exams. So make sure that you use these resources, you utilize them. These are available to free, no extra pay, uh, you know, payments that you need to make to ACCA to use these resources. These are included in your membership, in your registration, which you have done. So make sure that you take advantage of these resources. Now, uh, going back to our slides, uh, I'm just going to briefly begin with the first chapter. So if you saw on the study hub also, chapter number one is about management information systems and data analytics. So again, this is something which has been taught in the knowledge level exams, which a lot of you would have taken exemptions for, but no worries, we're going to cover it and you know we're going to talk about it, understand it fully so that even if there are section A questions coming up from the syllabus area, we're not only able to, uh, you know, understand them, but also answer them correctly. So this is what the first chapter talks about. The first subtopic in this chapter is managing information. So the name itself has management information systems. So it becomes important that we understand what exactly are information systems. So over here, if you see information system is nothing but all of the hardware and software, all of the networks that you have to do all of the things with information. So what all do you do with information? Number one, you first collect the information, then you find place to store the information because in big companies, there's a lot of information which is collected. So once it is collected, you need to store that information. Then once that information has been stored, it gets processed. 
you know, to make sense out of the information, you process it and then it becomes data. And then once it becomes data, you have processed it, you can gather something out of it, then you eventually communicate it. So this is what information systems are. It is hardware, software, networks, which are used to do everything to information. And what all things we do with information, we collect it, we store it, we process it, and then we communicate it. So what all does, you know, information system help you with? So number one, it's going to help you with planning. How does it help you with planning? It helps you with, you know, setting the long-term direction for the company, planning even for the medium as well as the short term. So what you're supposed to do, is, uh, you know, information systems can help you do the planning. And then second is your control. So control basically means where we are seeing whether, you know, what things we had planned, uh, are they going according to our plan or are, they, are there any fluctuations? Are there any variations? So information systems also help you track, also help you monitor, you know, how the organization is doing, what you had planned, uh, you know, is the same thing being done or not. So you know whether you are on track or not. If at all you are not on track, you're going to take an action because using information systems, you're able to find out that, you know, something is going wrong. Then if you find it out early in, you know, early enough, then you're also able to take actions to correct that. You know, whatever is not happening, perhaps your labor are lazy, they are not producing enough goods. So then that is when you hold a meeting with the labor and tell them that, you know, we are uh, not meeting our targets, we're supposed to work harder. So this is how controlling is something which can be done better if we have information systems. And then uh, one more thing is decision making. So, you know, there are a lot of decisions which are taken every day in all organizations. So, uh, you know, probably deciding about how much cash we should hold, deciding about uh, how many inventory we should have. So all of the decisions which we make, we require some information to, uh, you know, with the help of which we make the decision. If I know with the help of my information system that my inventory is going to finish soon, that is when I make the decision that I need to order more inventory. So this is how information systems also help you with the decision-making aspect. Now, uh, when you talk about these three things, planning, control, decision-making, basically there are three levels of management which are there in every organization. Number one is your top management. So you would have heard about your CEOs, CFOs, CMOs. So these are the top level, C-level executives who are, you know, at the chief positions in the company. Uh, these are the people who are responsible, you know, where the company is going in the long term. They are always looking ahead towards the future. How can we make the company better? Then uh, the second in the hierarchy is what you will find as the middle level of management. So the middle management is primarily about, you know, uh, the people who get the work done from the people who are actually there on the floor to do the work. So the supervisors, the managers of all of the employees who are working at the ground level is what you will find the middle management to be doing. So the middle management talks about relatively middle term, you know, uh, something probably about one year, three year, five year time horizon. They will be deciding about those things, uh, thinking about how the company can be doing better. So this is what, uh, you know, middle management looks like. And then if I talk about the lower, uh, lower level of management where, you know, you have the immediate employees who are working on the floor. So basically, these are the people who are responsible to carry out the day to day operations. So their areas of planning pertains to daily plans rather than yearly or, you know, 10 year plans or something like that. They only look at, you know, what is happening today, the day to day operations. So th that is what you call as the lower level of management. So over here, the number one, which I told you, the top management, this is what they will do strategic planning. Strategic planning, like I told you, they will be deciding the goals. They will be setting the objectives for the long term. This will be, you know, typically between five to 15 years. So over here, they are concerned with the long term, what the company is going to do in the long term now what all will they decide anything which will you know pertain to uh deciding what product we want to make which markets we should be in so perhaps probably if we are now only in india then which uh, country should we expand to next so this is something which the top management will be deciding this is also called as strategic planning 
then investment decisions obviously if you know i want to buy some uh, you know i want i'm producing some new goods so obviously i need some new machinery some kind of new technology to produce that so whether or not i should invest in such things so investment decisions are also a part of your strategic planning then planning for environmental changes you have all seen how you know environment has become so important these days people are more aware of you know what's happening to the environment or uh, everyone is talking about sustainable development so uh, you know this is something which the top level management is uh, you know making a part of strategic planning that they should you know aim to do something good for the environment also uh, specifically talking about companies which are you know basing their business on uh, let's suppose non renewables like uh, petrol diesel so all of these companies should definitely think of new alternatives you know something about renewable energy sources like solar energy wind energy they should do something like that if they want to keep their company going in the longer term because the renewables are the future these fossil fuels all of the you know fuel which is based on fossil fuels and non renewable resources these are going to exhaust soon and we are going to have to transition to the renewables then uh, if you see the next point over here identifying the competitive advantage of the organization definitely whenever you know you are operating your business you, there's always a lot of competitors how you're going to face those competitors how you you're going to build your advantage against those competitors how you're going to differentiate from your competitors is also what the top management will think of and this falls under the purview of strategic planning now uh you know the top level of management can also be called as the strategic level of management hence the planning that they do is also called as strategic planning then the next which i told you in hierarchy the second in hierarchy was your middle management middle management can also be called as the tactical management hence the planning that they do is called tactical planning so usually they will do it for a period of one year the plans that they make will usually lie for a period of one year now what all do they do in tactical planning number one that whatever resources that the organization has uh, be it people be it you know monetary financial resources everything should be used effectively as well as efficiently so there should be no wastages you know no one sitting idle all of the resources which the organization has should be utilized should be utilized to their best capacity so that they are used in you know achieving what the organization wants to achieve achieving the objectives of the organization then uh, tactical planning also includes implementing strategic decisions so the top level management has told you that you have to do this 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 now the next level which is the tactical management is actually responsible to implement those plans which were provided by the top level of management so over here any strategic decision which the strategic level of management has taken will be implemented by the tactical level or the middle level of management then if you talk about more things they, because they are working on an annual basis they will be preparing annual budgets they will be prepare you know also comparing those with the actual results if what we had budgeted is something uh, you know we have been able to achieve or did we spend more than we were supposed to do and there could also be monthly budgets where they you know are monthly comparing whether or not we are on track and you know tactical management will also be responsible for the recruitment of staff you cannot expect the ceo or cfo to actually go out and take interviews to recruit staff it's going to be the middle level of management the tactical level of management to recruit the staff then talking about the last level of management which is the lower level you can also call it as the operational level of management so the planning that they do is called the operational planning so like i told you this focuses on day to day running day to day operations of the organization so what all will they be doing they will be you know doing the routine planning like rosters schedules you know which staff is going to work on which department which staff is going to work on which order so routine planning like you know how are the resources going to be utilized then one more thing will be regarding you know uh, uh, decisions which they make regard uh, what uh, as per the information which is available so let's suppose uh, you know the inventory has fallen down and it is at that level where we reorder because we are soon going to run out of inventory so that is where uh, you know operational uh, level employees will also 
uh, you know, order inventory when the inventory has fallen to the level where they place the next order. Then, uh, you know, uh, why do these, uh, you know, uh, operational uh, managers take these decisions is that because uh, there are criteria which are set. So probably let's suppose we are in an organization where, uh, you know, the reorder level, the level at which we place the order, let's suppose is uh, 500 units. Now the inventory has come to, let's suppose 502 units and sooner or later it's going to be around 500 units. So that is how, because the 500 criteria of the order level has been set, you know, as soon as the inventory hits that level, the operational planner, the operational manager is going to take this decision and order the inventory whenever that inventory level has been reached. So this is how the planning that all of the three levels of management do will differ because their purview is different. Strategic planning focuses on long term, operational planning focuses on the day to day term. And, you know, the tactical is about the medium, you know, something in between. So they basically talk about a period of a year. So this is how, because they are, you know, focused on different durations, different purviews, that is how their planning also differs according to the role which they are doing. Now we stop here for uh, the first session. Uh, we will continue in the next session right from where we left off and um, I'll see you in the next class.